So welcome to Brave Bold Brilliant Podcast. I am your host, Jeanette Linfoot, and I am here today with an incredible guest, the absolutely phenomenal Rory Underwood. It's a bit of a build up, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I should say Rory Underwood, MBE, by the way. Um, so Rory's going to tell us all about his journey. So I'm not going to steal his thunder, but needless to say, just some of the key kind of headlines that I've picked up from the conversation we've had and also just reading about your illustrious career. So, you know, obviously former RAF flight lieutenant, England's highest ever try scorer. And now in your current world of entrepreneurial and entrepreneurism and business, uh, the founder and director of your fantastic company, Wingman, which helps businesses fulfill their true potential and creating high performing teams. Very good. <laughs> so welcome, Rory. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. So I think a great place to start. I mean, a lot of people are going to know you anyway from your certainly your career in rugby. Yeah. Um, but there's so much more to Rory Underwood than just the rugby, although that is fantastic in itself. So I think a cool place to, to go really would be if you wouldn't mind telling us about your journey, where life started for you. Crikey. <laughs> it's a long journey now, the age I'm at. Um, so uh, born in Middlesbrough, um, North Yorkshire at the time. So technically I can play for Yorkshire, which I did. Um, <laughs> but pretty much moved um, straight out to... Uh, my father was in Malaysia at the time because they, they came for holiday and I uh, ended up arriving a little bit earlier than expected. So, uh, bless her, my mum ended up staying with the mother, the in-laws, for the first time they'd met because they got married out in Malaysia. Um, having never met them for the first three, six weeks, something like that of my life, until I was old enough to then go and fly back. So my dad didn't see me until I was about three or four or whatever. Wow. Uh, eight weeks old. Um, so I grew up my life out in Malaysia. Um, Mum's the eldest of eight, so I had loads of uncles and aunts out in, in uh, Malaysia. Um, fantastic time. Started boarding school at the age of eight um, up in Barnard Castle, up in um, County Durham. Uh, so went through boarding school and uh, left in 1981. Um, most of that time I was travelling back and forth between the UK and uh, Malaysia. Um, and really that's that's the the catalyst that got me interested in flying. Uh, I always wanted to see what's it like out the front of the aircraft. You know, you, <laughs> you look out the side and all you see is this little small little hole, and you see the terminals go past and nothing much else. So I said, what's it like out the front? You know, the runway and taking off and stuff. So I got my interest in flying, and uh, at school I joined the combined cadet force and I joined the air force section, um, and got into that flying side through there. I wasn't the um, I wasn't the uh, the cleverest from an academic point of view. Um, really struggled through my O levels and, and A levels, um, but managed to do enough to get into the Royal Air Force. And primarily, I knew I wasn't going to have. You needed a degree to get in and, and do a um, a big um, air, light tran air, light, air, air transport pilot's license for uh, the big, you know, flying for British Airways OAC of those in those mm. days and British Airways and whoever. Um, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to do that, so that's it. I went down the Air Force line. I mean, there's one catchphrase, was it the, um, well, you can't do a loop the loop in a jumbo jet, was one of them, was uh, one of the remember catch lines. <laughs> but I sort of got sucked into the Air Force, you know, the um, the whole Air Force uh, recruitment um, stuff that was going on. They they, they, they appealed to me and I, I wanted to join the Air Force. And so when I left school, I applied for the Air Force. It took me a couple of times to get in, but I got in and I started uh, officer training in 1983. In the meantime, I'd been playing rugby and by the end of school, I'd, I'd, I'd got recognised in the county area for, for uh, Durham, um, but never got quite any further for Durham schoolboys under 18s. The following year was when it all suddenly kicked off, when I got um, picked up by Durham, Durham County to play for them, the senior side at the age of 18, so the first, literally was September after I left school. Uh, then I got picked up by um, uh, England Colts, so I played for England Colts in the 19s. At the end of the season, I got picked up by the England 23s, and I went on a. This is this is this is amateur rugby. I went on a week's tour to Italy. Uh, we left on a Saturday and came back on the Sunday, I think it was, and we played Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday afternoon. Wow! And there's about seven of us that played in all three games uh, against Italy 23s, Italy B, and Italy the full team. Um, but it was a great experience. Um, and then uh, I changed my allegiance from Durham 
because I was uh, obviously from Barney Castle uh, School playing at Middlesbrough Rugby Club at the time. But then I changed my allegiance the following year to Yorkshire. So I played for Yorkshire, um, played for England B, and then not long after that, I, I ended up joining the Air Force in 1983. So I left, I left uh, Middlesbrough, moved down to uh, East Midlands, which is where I am now. <laughs> uh, went into uh, officer training and was commissioned June 83. So started flying training at uh, Cranwell on the Jet Provost. Um, and through pilot training, uh, through officer training, I was, it was just concentrating. I was four months of officer training before I was graduated as a pilot, acting pilot officer. And um, uh, it, obviously I couldn't do any rugby or whatever. Although saying that, and I did play for the Air Force. The Air Force dragged me out of Austria training to go and play for them in inter-services. Uh, but then when I started flying training at, uh, in August, that's when I got the call from Leicester to say, we heard you should move down here, would you like to come and join us? So I went and joined Leicester Tigers and that's, that started my 14 year um, playing career with, with Leicester Tigers. So, um, so then it all gets blurred into one now because obviously I started uh, my career 18 years in the Royal Air Force in 83. I didn't leave till 2001. Um, in 1984, literally, so the following year after I joined the Air Force, that's when I got picked up to play for England. So it all went barking mad. Just You can imagine all the press having um, a winger who's a pilot and got a name of Rory. <laughs> there, was, there was plenty of puns whizzing around about you know the flying winger and roaring down the wing and all sorts of different things. So um, uh, it... Uh, that's 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 when it all started, and of course, what people sometimes forget is they can remember me from my uh, rugby days. But a lot of them, a lot of people sometimes think that I was being paid at the time because mm. people think of the game now being a professional game as it is. Yes. Um, but in those days, it wasn't because the game didn't turn professional until 1995. Mm. So um, the way, I, so during the 80s and early 90s, I, I described it to people. It says the best way of describing it is uh, my job was flying jets in the Royal Air Force my hobby was playing rugby, yeah. albeit a handful of times a year you played rugby for England at Twickenham. Uh, but I literally would play, you know, there's, there's, there's this picture of me running down the wing at Twickenham and I say, yeah, I got paid 12p a mile for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, expenses. So um, so the rugby career, you know, I finished my rugby career in 1999. I did 14 years at Tigers, did two years uh, at Bedford before I eventually retired and it was, the advent of professional rugby came in 95, 96. By the time I got to 99, I'm getting older and slower and people are getting fitter because they're, they're training full time. So mm. it was it was um, pretty much written in the stars. Um, my flying career, I went through the flying training system and got as far as the Tornado and did the start of the Tornado conversion unit. Um, unfortunately, during the course, I failed the course and was um, sent on to fly the Canberra. So I spent six and a half years at Witten flying the Canberra. Uh, T17 on 360 squadron, so the spottos will want to, you know, they'll go and look it up, whatever. Yeah. So flying in an ECM role. Um, and then I transferred from 100, uh, 360 squadron onto 100 squadron, which is flying the Hawk. Hawk is the same aircraft as what the Red Arrows fly, so it's very right. similar, it's just not painted red. Um, so I flew for them for four and a half years. I then ended up doing a three and a half year uh, ground tour, so flying a desk, as we say. Um, and I got involved in human factors uh, training in the Royal Air Force then and also as a station flight safety officer. And really that, that three years then was really a formative time that paved the way for me to do what I'm doing now. Mm. I got trained as a, as a facilitator, I got trained in human factors um, training, um, and also in um, flight safety, uh, the, obviously the flying version of health and safety. And uh, that really sort of shaped my thinking around the whole context of human performance from a flying perspective, but how to apply it from a, a business perspective. And then uh, I finished that tour, and then I finished my last three years flying the Domini out of Cranwell, which is why I ended up in this area again. It was a, um, it's like a small executive jet we used for, for, for training navigators and uh, rear crew, air crew. So I, f I finished that. Primarily, I, I got managed to get myself on that job because I was trying to get my ATPL license because I was planning to go and just leave at uh, 38 and go and join BA. That was my right. plan, to go and be a jumbo jet pilot. And um, circumstances, when I finished playing rugby in 98, 99, I knew that I was coming to the, you know, any money that I was earning by the time it was professional, I was earning a bit of money on the side from playing rugby and various things, you know, suddenly would sort of start dwindling as, mm. you, as you come to the end of your career. Long story short, a couple of sort of reaching out and various things, I, I got speaking to a, 
a guy at the time who was uh, CEO of uh, Unipart, um, part of the Unipart uh, empire. And um, we were talking about stuff, and I told him what I was thinking of doing, and he said, right, I want you to do a uh, proposal for me. So I had a couple of people, friends of mine, who we were talking about doing something, and this came up, so we thought we'd give it a go. And suddenly, in the space of four months, we went from nothing to forming a company, putting some ideas together, putting a proposal together, and like, how do you write a proposal? How do you cost a proposal? How do you write a proposal? Um, to winning the business, delivering it, being told we were really good, and there being money in the bank. And it was like, oh my God. I and mean, it was just like four or six months, something like that. And that that really suddenly was another sort of um, uh, change in direction of my whole out of the business when we sort of thought, hell, yeah, this is, enjoyed doing it. People think we're quite good. We mm. think we've got something here. Um, so, um, so I left the Air Force in 2001 and we made a go of it. And we, we ran the company until 2008, 2009, when obviously we had the crash, which caused mm. all sorts of problems. Yeah. Um, and I just decided at the time that uh, it was probably a good time for me to decide to go on my own. So I decided to leave the business uh, then and set up my own business, Wingman as was. And so uh, that's Wingman. We started in uh, April of 2009. So we're coming up for, uh, say, 11 years now. Wow, fantastic. Gosh, it's, I mean, really, when you look back over all that, you know, that, that period, you've almost got three three parts oh, yeah, to definitely. your, to yeah. your you know, your career life, really, haven't you? Without a doubt, that, you know, the whole context of Wingman, where it came from, as people would understand, you know, I was a winger on the pitch. Yeah. Um, wingman is obviously recognised in the flying parlance, mm. watching Top Gun or whatever. And, and people recognise that what our, um, what we're trying to help businesses with is like being their wingman. Yeah. So it's very much, there's a tripartite um, element to our business. So it's it's the flying world, the, the sport world and, and business, definitely. Mm, and I think that's quite unique because you often, I mean, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail around, you know, sort of some of the lessons and learnings and applications that happen in the sporting world being mm. applied to the business world, yeah. but to also have that military uh, discipline and, and all of the rigor around that yeah, yeah. as well. That's that's quite a unique combination. Yeah. Um, I don't. I can't think of many people that have got that. No, I would actually. just basically it probably is unique. Yeah. Um, it, to the extreme, you know, to be a fast jet pilot, uh, international sports uh, person, team, obviously, and uh, you know, I've been doing consultancy what 21 22 years now yeah yeah no it's fantastic i mean and this this whole you know ethos of this podcast about being brave bold and brilliant is all about how people can achieve their full potential you know fulfill their dreams yeah. um, and I, I thought it was interesting what you said earlier around when you were when you were a little you know a, little, a wee lad thinking oh gosh i want to be at the front of the plane what's yeah. it like to fly yeah. and sort of having that dream if you like at an early age and then fulfilling that and getting to the absolute top is, of your I, game i mean obviously that. that sort of age it was more of a curiosity than necessarily a, a, a dream of, of wanting to end up being a pilot per se but it yeah. was that curiosity that sort of driven that sort of initial thought that sort of built built to what it was later on yeah yeah, yeah. and and you talked about your sort of earlier life in terms of family and you know your sort of your, your background with your father and your mother and and I guess your dad being away from home quite a lot and you yeah. were between Malaysia and the UK how do you think that influenced kind of you know your life um, and sort of where you are today or, or did it not really influence well you without doubt my mother's the biggest influence most people know my mother she's she's probably more as, as, as famous I am my, my brother <laughs> Um, my father it's, it's, it's interesting because when, when I reflect back cause my father died when I was 18 right yeah. so for the first um, well most of my life and except for the first the first seven eight years then we were living in Malaysia so you know we were just a typical family out expat family living out in, mm. in Malaysia but once I started boarding school obviously for three school I was I was there and then I came back for holidays and then it was work, so we had the holiday. So it was relatively um, normal. Um, but then when eventually he was uh, moved back to the UK, um, it was 77 and 78, and three, four years later on he died. Yeah. So I suppose you could argue my formative years, uh, it's, there was, you know, he was away a lot. Mm. You know, like most either expats or um, military type people can find, you know, the, the parents being away a lot. And so my mum was the biggest influence, without a doubt, on mm. that. And where I look at it, you know, my mum's been fantastic supporter. She's always, you know, as, as people know from the, the videos of her jumping up and down in the stands. But, <laughs> you know, my dad was the real out-and-out -out, um, sports nut. I mean, he was a football football coach and all that sort of stuff. 
and you know being living out in Malaysia in, in the tropics and you know we just well, we used to play football you know every, whatever daylight we were out there kicking a the ball around in right. the garden yeah I knew nothing about rugby until I was 11 I'd never played rugby until I was 11 and um, you know for him to have missed out he he died literally the Sunday after I got my first cap for England Colts so I played for England Colts against the French youth on the Saturday down at Portsmouth and they, they came out to watch and they saw me get my cap in the dinner um, and he died on the Sunday night so he saw me he saw me get some sort of recognition of, of national which was fantastic but yeah. for him to miss out for somebody who was so big into sport the next you know 20 years of what I achieved in in playing for England the Lions yeah. I mean you know that's 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 a real that's a real shame it really is yeah gosh i mean you're incredibly proud clearly yeah you're like yeah of course you'd, you'd like to think so yeah um and you like to think he's obviously up there looking down so yeah yeah and and playing with your brother tony mm. um because I, I was i was thinking about this on on the drive um and i was thinking well gosh you know to have two really successful rugby players in the family mm. you know is that is it nature is it nurture you know you start asking all of these kind of questions and how was it playing together then uh, with with tony well, it's interesting because um, there's, there's four of us in the family, and so I'm the oldest, but Tony's the number three. Mm. So there's a six-year gap between us. Okay. Yeah. So we never played at school because I was up at six and he was first year. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, we never crossed paths at school. My, my n number two brother, we played rugby at school. Um, but G Gary was, uh, he, he was okay at rugby, but never got to the same heights. He was never quite as quick as myself and Tony. But he was a much better... Um, with hand-eye coordination type stuff, so squash, tennis, cricket, he was he was really outstanding. He became a, um, a, a tennis coach and stuff like that. So that tended to be more his sport. And he mm. played rugby. He played rugby around the Nottingham area. He played because he went to Nottingham Trent Polytechnic and he um, played for Nottingham Twos a few times and for Paviors. Um, but it wasn't through Tony came through, and then Tony went to Leicester University. Ah, so okay. actually, he went to the university that I was playing for. Yeah. So you know, so he went there. He he obviously joined Tigers, and we started playing together excuse me, at Tigers. And so to be honest with you, it's like it became the norm. He was just playing with me at Tigers. Mm. And, you know, he was being very successful. And a good Leicester Tigers side at side. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't long before, because, uh, I mean, I played my first game for England in 1984. He played his first game for England in 92. So okay. I was coming to the end of my career and he came through. So from 92 to 96, when I eventually retired, we played, you know, most of that time together mm. uh, during the time. But then actually eventually I retired uh, from England, and then he had another two, three years of in and out um, yeah. with that. Um, so I think I think I should know this. I should know it. I think so. We played only eighteen games together, right? Which yeah. is still still quite, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it's like anything else. You know, it is it is great playing with brother, without a doubt. You know, you got him on the team, you got him on the, on the tours and stuff. But on the pitch, it's interesting. You, you know, I've always I've, I've this question a lot, and it's not. I'm not sitting there thinking, oh my god, I'm playing with my brother. He's another teammate. Yeah, okay. Albeit he is your brother. Yes. Um, so it's that sort of context. Um, but, you know, having two of us playing, and of course, mum was obviously very chuffed. Yeah, ab God, absolutely. I mean, yeah. she's uber proud, uber yeah. proud. And then when you were playing, and obviously, you know, British Lions, England, Leicester, I'd imagine the atmosphere and the, the motivation being quite different in each of those three. You know, you're playing for those three, but or, or were, are there sim, were there similarities? No, motivation, um, I mean, from my perspective, it's what, that's, at that sort of level, when you're playing at that high level, yeah. you're trying to strive to be the best you can be. Okay, yeah. Some would, you could argue when you, you sometimes, the, the biggest problem I think you tend to find with people who end up getting so high is when you start going to play for your club or for other sort of, um, so playing for the Air Force or anything like that, sometimes you've got to be very careful you don't end up just taking that too easy okay. and relaxing from the other thing. Mm. Um, and so that's that's half the challenge. You know, going out to Twickenham in front of 65,000 people, if you're not motivated, you shouldn't be playing. Yeah. You know, if you put your British Lions jersey on and you're going out in front of a Eden Park in front of, you know, 40,000 people at uh, New Zealand or uh, in Australia, then if you're not motivated, you're not in the right sport. Mm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, phenomenal to have had all of those, those oh, opportunities. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, what? It's been great. You know, I've, I've had, you know, I think for a, from my first tour was 87. My last tour was eight, 95. So for eight, nine years, I think I was away every summer on tour, all bar one or two. Mm. And the longest one was the Lions in 89, which was just under 10 weeks. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that's, that's a big commitment, isn't it? You mm. know, on a personal side and as well. And the Air Force, you know, brilliant. Outstanding, great supporters of me throughout that time. Without, without, you know, they were fantastic. Led me the time off and didn't put any pressure on me. It was brilliant. Well, I was going to actually, um, that was one of, going to be one of my questions, was how the hell did you manage <laughs> being, but, well, I guess, full-time in the RAF and playing at the same time? Well, but as I said to you, it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah. The thing was, it wasn't full-time. So you know, you basically worked and you fit your training around it. So yeah. in those days, training at Leicester was, was a uh, Monday and Tuesday nights, uh, Monday and Thursday nights, when I eventually went to Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Um, and when I went to play for the Air Force, obviously the Air Force, we yes, yeah. played for England, whatever. What it, what it boiled down to was, A, the powers that be in the Air Force recognised they had, they had something that was beneficial. Mm. So they paved the way. Whenever I went to a squadron or a station, they were made very clear you know who was who was who was there and and had to make you know not not make it um what's the, what's the word? yeah make sure there's no problems put in the patient's way so it's, as opposed yeah. to giving special treatment so that's a special treatment yeah but some people would depending which point you view and saying there's still special treatment but still uh, getting the benefit of both worlds um and as long as i made sure that we had this squadron sort of um, calendar on the board, which I showed all our detachments and all the pilots and their crew and stuff. So as long as you, the, the, the flight commanders say, just just put down when you're going to be away and we'll plan around you. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's strange because I've had several people sort of think that during February and March, I was basically away for two months. They thought I was not flying, doing no work and just doing rugby. Right. <laughs> Whereas... You know, in those days, when I first started, you know, we used to meet on a Thursday lunchtime. We'd train Thursday afternoon, play, uh, train Friday morning, play Saturday, then drive home Sunday. Mm. So I'd go back to work on Monday morning, 8 o'clock met brief, and then I would work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then drive down on a Thursday morning. So, you know, I was, I was still working full time. So, you know, a lot of people think that they sort of suspected because they see you playing rugby every, you know, yeah. four or five times and they see on pictures and, and they just assume you're, but no, you know, out of a two week period when I've got one international game, I'm working eight days and I'm off two days playing rugby. Um, some people have found that quite difficult to sort of fully get their head around. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's just, that's just the way it was. All of us are like that. We're all, we're all, you know, all of us are amateurs. All of us are working. We're policemen, solicitors, all sorts of different types of people working. Um, and uh, each of them had their ways of trying to make it work. And when you were working, because I mean, you're a very humble, humble guy, um, you know, and you, but even so, you must have the euphoria of playing in those matches um, and then going back to the day job, so to speak. How, how did well, it that is, But marry? the day job was not exactly, you know, boring. No, <laughs> not at all, not at all. But just in terms of, I suppose, your 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 fellow colleagues in the RAF and, and the team. Well, they got, they, got, they got used to it. You know, it's the same thing else. Once, you know, Whenever you, whenever you see people in the, in the sporting limelight, you always obviously have an impression of what they must be like. But until you actually meet them and work with them, you yeah. don't really know. And of course, they just know me as, you know, a pilot on the squadron. Yeah. And you know, I get busy on a weekend. And there's a bit of banter about because you get the sort of, you know, um, you know, you get some Welsh people in the, in the squadron or Scottish or whatever. And there's a bit of banter <laughs> out the, the Six Nations or Five Nations as it was in those days. Yeah. Uh, and various things. And then I come in one day, I've got a scratch on my head or, you know, I've got scrapes all over. But that's, that was just, it's, it's, it is the same with any other job, you know, anybody that's ever worked and they've had people on, on their, in their business who've played sport at highest level. Mm. It's just the same. They walk back in, it's just Jeff who, you know, plays, at watch, you know, whatever on a Saturday. But um, it's, to be honest with you, I think for me, that's one of the things that made it easier that you come back down to it, albeit my job, you know, I play in front of 65,000 people on a Saturday and then on Monday morning I jump into a jet and fly around at low level at 450 miles an hour. So, <laughs> you know, but from the point of view of people, you go back to the squadron and it's, you know, I must admit, it's sometimes, you know, you get you get stressed at work and you're getting hard, busy, whatever, and you, I drive to, to Tigers and we run around a rugby pitch and let our frustrations out there and it sort of, you know, calms you down and then sometimes you think you're getting really, you know, um, playing really well and you start to get a bit uh, carried away and then you w go back home and then you give them <laughs> shoved a three-year-old, you know, two-year-old baby with being sick all the place and say, clean that up. And that brings you down to a, <laughs> down to uh, some sort of sense of uh, normality. 
and then and, and it's sort of a river cycle so having having the three different parts of my life actually in some ways i i utilize that in a way of trying to balance the whole sort of mental as well as physical side of things mm. of trying to keep myself um uh level-headed to a certain extent but also not get carried away in one thing because if you just focus on just the fitness side you just become very focused on that you forget about the life and various things yeah and having a job which is which is a job as opposed to a hobby which it was for me mm. puts a whole different complexion on it. and of course in the middle of my rugby playing career we had the the gulf war and yeah. i never i didn't went out there but i knew people that did yeah, so that focuses the mind yeah. Um, with some of your colleagues and uh, people you've flown with who uh, who went out there and some of them didn't come back. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the whole thing of that uh, is, and and if there's one if there's one lesson I learned from that, which I sort of half alluded to, is that as soon as you find out, tell them. So, as soon as you knew we were having to go away, tell them. As soon as you uh, couldn't do that because of this, tell them. So, mm. part of communication from that, and it applies 100% with um, my relationship with um, my dear beloved wife is as soon as you know something, tell them. Because if you hold on to it and do it later, it will be 10 times worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but from a, from, a, from a business and trying to get the balance, because obviously trying to balance the whole context of, of flying um, uh, with the rugby and with family life, it, you had to be constantly you know, ahead of the game. So you had to let people know what was going on. Yeah, so work on the base of no surprises. Yeah, Yeah, I think that even if it's bad news, <laughs> yeah, just get it yeah, out definitely. there. Get out of there, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and there's so many, I think there's so many people striving for the elusive balance, right? You know, whether you're a working mum or whatever, you know, or you're like in your situation yeah. where you were, you know, balancing sort of, I suppose, three aspects of your of your life at any one time, really. Mm -hmm. um, but in you touched on mindset. Um, well, you know, you're talking about your sort of mental mental approach to things as well as the physical approach. How, how important has that been then for you? And, and how does that sort of play out in today's um, world for you as well? I think it's one of those things that, you know, unless you go into degree and proper look into it, we're not experts in it, but obviously we're all doing it in some way, shape or form. And you don't realise sometimes how much you are doing or not doing. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think from my, you know, um, mother's oriental um, genes, I've got that slight fatalistic sort of element to my, my sort of psyche. And I've always been a, an optimist with a small percentage of pessimism so I'm always looking at the bright side but always trying to be ready for the when it goes wrong yeah um I am I am I'm relatively phlegmatic I sometimes wonder whether I'm getting less as I'm getting older um some people would say some you know there are times people wish they just would like to stick a grenade up my bum and whatever and I don't know whether that and it's not meant to be a core exterior it's just as, as we each of us you know we all in our own ways have our own personalities etc um, and I don't know. I, th I suppose I've always had, I've always had a sense of confidence about being able to at least try things and do things. Um, I'm not a massive risk taker, but I think some people look at me and look at what I've done in my life and go, "Oh my God, yes, you have," which is then obviously quite an interesting quandary or paradox to sort yeah. of try and get your head round. Um, you know, I look at. The fact that I left the military, didn't go into flying, but decided to start my own business. Um, suddenly, you know, Wendy was not still looking after kids and various things, so mm. it was still a major challenge. Um, it might not work or whatever. Um, to then deciding to leave that company and start again 11 years ago, mm. um, you know, it's uh, to think that I set off on those two sort of things. For some people in the business world, it just happens. But some people have just been in the same situation for a long time and don't yeah. don't even think about it. So um, I don't know. I'm I'm you know I, in in the world that I'm in, in the old consultancy and, and like you are, there's elements of we are. You could argue um, have some form of amateur psychology about us because of what we have to help mm. you know people that we. Um, um, talk to in our uh, working life but as to whether I um, fully understand how it works with me is a fascinating one you know mm. it's um, it's like anything else there are, there are things that you do you look back and regret that you've done there's there's, there's lessons you've 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 learned there's lessons you haven't learned and you know it, it's just because some people look at you and think you've been 
you're such a successful person. You've done flying. You've done um, rugby. You've had two companies. You know, but I think all of us would would acknowledge every for every successful person, there have been hundreds of mistakes we've made along the way. Yeah. <laughs> and I suppose some of it is how do you overcome that? Yeah. And I suppose one thing I suppose a sense of resilience is is quite important. I think that's something that um, I think I have. Whether I, I know it, I suppose it's that. It's that optimistic element I talk about that helps me with regards to that uh, overcoming um, and giving things a go. So it's it's interesting. Yeah, no, there's so much in there because I mean, to me, there's there's a couple of things just to pick up on. I think one is, um, I guess, approach to risk. You know, because clearly you've 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 been in risky <laughs> profession flying um, and sort of just pushing yourself to the edge of the limits, really, in mm. terms of whether it's flying or playing rugby or starting new businesses. So I guess your appetite for risk is probably higher than most, even if it's not a conscious. Decision. Yeah, I know. It's a really interesting one, because if you take I mean, when I was in the military and flying, you know, you get trained up, the risk becomes it's like anything else. The training mitigates the risk. Mm, yeah, it's not riskless. No, but your training, your ability, the quality of what we do, the people you work with, it 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 mitigates all that. Mm. Um, and of course, that what comes with training, working with each other, which all goes to stuff that we talk about with you know my yes. world. Um, and yet, when you think, when I think about, if I if I think about money, our life, my wife and I, the kids, what we do. What I what I do when I take decisions about stuff, um, I would put myself down into the mid range risk, and and right. I'm not risk averse, but I'm somebody who puts some a lot of thought into whether I want. I'm not somebody who goes, yeah, let's give it a go. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah. so consider um, risk. Yeah, it's that sort of yeah. area. Yeah, um, and yet I can quite understand why, and it's different, you see, because it goes back to the. I didn't. I didn't even think about the risk per se of wanting to join the air force and be a pilot. I just wanted to be a pilot. Now, there's lots of risk associated with regards to whether you can make it or not, mm. and also the risk that goes with the job that's um, inherent with it. Um, but I didn't. It didn't. That didn't even cross my mind. I wanted to be a pilot. As yeah. simple as that. So I saw, saw saw the end game, and as you went through it, you sort of learned about some of the risks, as we talked about um, playing. It was an amateur job. I was a shelby. It was it was a hobby. It wasn't exactly a job. So, you know, making mistakes on a rugby pitch is is part and parcel of of playing sport. Mm. So it was there and there. You know, risk in a business sense has been has been the biggest learning for me. You know, the last twenty years of running two businesses, um, both from the point of internally the world of business, understanding other businesses, what you learn, um, the risk that people take, the risk that people don't take. Um, it's it's fascinating. It really is. Mm. No, I agree with you. Because and it, and you know it's 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 interesting how some people push themselves to live their dreams really, mm. and you know whatever that might be in business, personal, career, um, and how other people don't for for a number of reasons. I know. Like, it fascinates. Yeah, me, no. Actually. I mean, I think I look at myself. Um, I mean, my wife Wendy, she was an air traffic controller in the in the military. So you know, to you know, it's a great job again. You know. Mm. Um, really sort out the job, and then I became a partner in the Royal Air Force. So you sort of think we're sort of quite driven people, but in some ways, I don't, I don't know. It's just one of those those strange things in the job sense. I was. Um, I have to cut that bit off. There was a, there was a thought that I came up with and I forgot what it was now. Oh, it's the usual thing I go in in circles. Um, it was just something around the lines of. Um, um, Don't that. worry, don't worry. We'll cut. We'll it comes with old bit. age. <laughs> we were talking about. Um, we were talking about uh, sort of, I suppose, taking risks, pushing yourself, you know, into um, to achieve your full potential, and how some people do, some right, people don't. Right. Sorry, that's what I So yeah, we take, the thing with internet taking risk, it's like I've I made a conscious decision that you know, as much as I want to be successful in business life, I wasn't going to. Um, live to work yeah so you know if i had to uh you know i'd work late or work weekends or whatever but it wasn't my first default choice mm. 
with our work, we go around the country, we stay in hotels and we stay overnight and that sort of stuff. That, that's kind of part and parcel with it. And you know, with rugby and, and, yeah. and uh, <laughs> Air Force, you're, you're away from home anyway. Um, so that's not a problem. But when I see some people who will work 20 hours a day or whatever of seven days a week and drive mm. the business successfully and unsuccessfully, you know, that's, that's not me. So it's interesting when you talk about drive, when you yeah. see some people who will, you know, drive that way in trying to create success for the business. But I've been somebody who's very much tried to, a part of that, I think that's thinking comes from me from the balance of my life with the Air Force and with family life. Is to, I can remember the, one of the first person I remember talking to about um, getting work-life balance and, and a one, one person who will remain nameless, who we both know, um, he hated that expression because he thought that it meant 50-50. Yeah, And compromise. of course, when yeah. you really want to go somewhere, it's not, yeah, it'll tend to be, what about it? Because he was taking it literally with regards to, because balance, what balance means is that whatever you're putting into both things the scales, is, yeah. is, it could be 80-20, but both both sides are happy with it. Yeah. So your family life is, is okay and your work life is okay. Yeah. If it needs to be 50-50, it needs to be 50-50, as opposed to the inference is balanced life is it's got to be half and half yeah yeah so that was that was a, a fascinating and interpretation because that's what you know people interpret things in different ways yeah yeah um but it's it's that whole um yeah you know if when i'm here and i get towards nearly five o'clock and i go there's nothing really important to do do that things tomorrow i'll, I'll go home you yeah, know, yeah it's there's yeah. no um whereas i know i'm trying to get a, a, a proposal off and i'm trying to finish it off i'll work to whatever hours i need to work to mm. get it finished off um, and get it off because I said I'd get it to them the next day, and that that, that comes from my that comes from my military background. If if I say we get something to somebody by such and such, you do. I, I do. Yeah. Or at least if I can't, I let people know that I can't. Yeah, yeah. That's that comes from my military training. Definitely. Yeah, and I think that that that's absolutely spot on. I mean, for me, I think it's a lot about being fully present in the moment. And you might be working really intensely on a you know a proposal or with a client, and that might mean very long days, or you know, and then other times it might be actually yeah, I can take my foot off the gas. I can say, oh, you mm. know what, actually I'm just going to have a day well, off. So I think today, it's, it's one of the problems for, and is you know, one of the problems you have for entrepreneurs or business owners is that sometimes you don't realise how little time you give to yourself. True. Yeah. So, I you know, I, I that's that's where Jane comes in. You know, it's have I working on this? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, okay. So you know, and you sometimes forget because you'll you'll block off your two weeks from a holiday, and you have bits and pieces. But then, then you you actually don't have that many days holiday. You know. Yeah. So um, it's one of those things where sometimes you've got to remember. I mean, my my godfather says to me, you know, I work for the worst person in the world, um, as a you know as a as a uh, self-employed uh, director because you work you don't pay yourself enough and you don't give us enough t- enough time off. So it's yeah. this kind of thing. You recognise that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it's 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 one of those things to sometimes forget. You need you know you still find a world. Make sure your staff do, but you need it as as well. Mm. Um, and sometimes I have to say, okay, I block off. Um, you know, some time off to get. Even if it's just go and sit at home watching Sky movies or whatever. At least you just downtime with your, your brain. Well, you'll know that from training, won't you, as well, yeah, you know, from, yeah. even from your sporting well, from Physical days. as well as a mental Absolutely, point Absolutely, yeah, yeah you know, but I suppose it's it's light and shade, isn't there? You, know, you can't have light without without dark, it's yin, yin and yang. But it and... goes back to just the balancing, because for some people you'd argue that they want, they can do more of that than this, but some people it's, it's they're less than that. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's trying to manage it, as you said, Individually, for what works for you. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about the business um, side of things then, Rory, if we may, because um, obviously you made that you know you made that jump out of sport RAF into becoming an entrepreneur, and 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 that happened really fast for you with that first mm. business that you set up, um, and and here you are today again with a really successful business, Wingman, which you obviously seem very passionate about. Um, so just talk us about t- talk us through the business, kind of what it's all about, and um, what you're trying to achieve with wingman and, and just give us a flavor really because i i think it's from what you've told me there's so much value in here for people listening in mm. terms of how, that will resonate for them personally either with their own business or to get some ideas in terms of how you know you might even be able to help them for example but i think it's a great concept you've yeah. got well i mean it all started because i was asked to do loads and loads of keynote speeches during the 90s when i was still playing <laughs> And as much as it's very well paid, you yeah. know, you just speak for half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, and you get paid, you know, a decent chunk of money. 
I didn't, I didn't find it as fulfilling uh, or enjoyable. I get people coming to me and say they really enjoyed it or whatever, but mm. I, I had it described to me, it's like, it's like a Chinese meal, you know, enjoy it at the time, but within two hours you're hungry again. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you get a handful of people that come enjoy it. And of course, there's the whole, as people argue, argue the whole sort of, um, oh, another sportsman doing another speech. Mm. Another, you know, mm. I, I'm not a rugby international team. I'm just trying to run my team in my thing. And so for some people that it didn't, you know, sometimes it doesn't quite um, sit with people that mm. could take it as, as um, comfortably. Um, and when I went to the human factors realm, this suddenly opened up a whole different way of looking at it because before it was like team, you know, rugby and how do I, yes. and I talked about what my lessons are learned from the rugby pitch, but then suddenly this whole avenue opened up of, of, of human factors which started getting me, because we talked about um, decision making, effective comms, and situational awareness. And it really opened my mind around looking from a different perspective about the way us as human beings perform and how we're good and bad mm. at it and how fundamentally um, we will make mistakes because we are human. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 people think that uh, it's a strange quirk or it's something wrong that you make mistakes. <laughs> no, we are human, we will make mistakes. Mm. Um, and so that really brought my mind, and that's that's what sort of started the idea about okay, so we can go from it being just doing a speech to um, okay, well we can elongate that and try and get more into the sort of bread and butter about it, and try and really understand and get in the skin of how we can help people to do things rather than just me spouting. It's just that, and it's sort of the early days of me trying to get because it's what's passionate for me. I you know, the the rapport, the relationship I have with clients is as important as you know, the final. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you want them to gain the success out of it. So, you know, for me, mutually beneficial relationships is is paramount mm. to this sort of thing. You know, I haven't quite got to that stage yet, but um, you might have to beat this out, but there's another member phrase, which, you know, I want to get a stage where I've got this fucking money, where actually, we don't like you, we don't work with you, so I don't want your money. Yeah. And you, and, yeah. you know, you can afford not to Absolutely, take yeah. the money. Um, and having that ability to be able to do that, you know, and I know there's a whole thing. Well, if it's your, if it's your values and your whatever, there are. But as you know, currently in the situation we are now, there are times when you know, you need money to keep the business going. Sure, so, and it's a very difficult balance because you can have a whole debate around that. But anyway, yeah. Um, I just say there's been nobody that have had that really bad where I said no. <laughs> There have been a few that have come very close to go, you know, really what, you know, I don't enjoy working with them. So, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to push it. If they but don't. you can choose, right? You're yeah. in a position to choose. So that's what started it. And I got to a colleague of mine who was doing keynote speeches and stuff. And we got this idea. We chucked a few ideas around and talked about it. And he said he had a mate. So that's what started the whole uh, avenue going down. I've setting the company up, uh, which was just UPH. It was just our initials, Underwood Peters Halliwell, uh, which suddenly just kicked off. Um, and the space of six months went from an idea to literally, I got the phone call from the guy on, I think it was a Tuesday night, Monday night, I was literally driving to training in his early days of mobile phones. I got a phone call from him saying, oh, that idea, yeah, can you do me a proposal for two and a half days for my, my team of 10, uh, my senior management team? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I rang John up and said, uh, what's the idea for me? And so the following Thursday, his friend drove up from uh, Portsmouth, he drove up from London, I drove down from, um, uh, my place. We met at Little Chef at Sandy on the A1, and we sort of just sort of, what do you think? You know, and we just threw a few ideas around, and suddenly we had to try and you know form a company. As I said, put a proposal together. You know, I tell you what, you know, talk about um, a steep learning curve. You know, what seems normal now, and everybody sort of thinks, you know, just write a proposal. But how do you word it? How do you structure it? How do you cost it? I mean, we had lots of debates as to should we charge, should we not charge, what do you charge for that? How much do you charge? Day rate, person rate? I mean, just, you know, it was a real learning curve. Um, we put something in, they haggled over the price. But yeah, okay. But then they said, okay, let's do this. And obviously their budget. And um, bang, we got paid for doing it. And they, at the end of it, they said, really, really enjoyed this, you know, got a lot out of it, blah, blah, blah. So, um, uh, you know, that, that sort of kick-started it all uh, into doing it. And so um, that was the... That was an interesting start about doing that. And I would say that we started out as pretty much a team building company, but a a more um, uh, with depth, should we say. So I'm all for doing all the sort of fun stuff and colored vests and activities and 
doing go-karting and stuff like that. And I, 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 it has a place. It does yeah. have a place. Yeah. But we took it another level down. So we, we got involved in psychometric profiling uh, with Belbin and SDI. Um, we utilised the experience of camping out at night uh, in the woods, under bivouac, around a campfire. People just start beer, chat around. They start talking to each other. Mm. It's that, uh, I think it's Elliot who said it, but um, an unusual experience in the man engenders a need to talk. And using that, so mm. I mean, the number of times the next day that everybody's talking, um, which is, you know, fundamentally, if everybody communicated effectively with each other in their businesses, we would be out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, and we started out learning curve massively. We knew we obviously with three military guys, we had all our training from the military, so we had a lot of that leadership and whatever. But putting it into a package that worked in a civilian environment, knowing what we can mm. do, can't do, and various things, it was, you know, you could argue very risky, but it was also this, we had this phrase, winged it, which is a well-known phrase, but we knew that as long as we got the structure right, because of our abilities, we could manage it as in what yeah. whatever came up. And um, so we, we went off and we got to, you know, about seven, eight people just before the crash. And obviously that seven, eight years, we'd learned a hell of a lot. But one of the big challenges we had during that time, and it's been something that's been with me for a long time, is the, what do we do? How do we do it? What do people think of us? What's our proposition? And it was a real big, it's a real big challenge for us. At the time, we just thought, well, what does it make a difference? People like us or not? But when I look back now and look at it, I can understand why um, it is so important. Because people need to understand why and what they're buying and yeah. what they're going to get out of it. Um, and we had several discussions about it and when you talked about USP it always boiled down to the three of us because the three of us as big characters was something that people went wow that's different you know I'm getting it from people who have been there seen it done it mm. as opposed to um, people who've written a book about it yes so that was a positive but then we were three blokes from the military and rugby mm. so there's a macho element to it which, which potentially had a, had a turning off from some people as well yes, yeah. So trying to get the right balance, trying to get the right uh, context. And one of the frustration things we got was that even though it is about team building, which is f fundamentally important to any business, as you know, um, it still didn't have the sort of same, aha, yes, I know what you do, I will hire you. There was still a sense of trying to get our whole concept across for them to understand it, what they're going to get out of it. And we really struggled with it mm. for a long time. Um, we had no idea how to sell. I mean, you know, we're making up as we're going along. Um, I had one bloke, you know, I remember one bloke saying to me, you know, it's not, it's a problem. I could tell they got passion with it, which is obviously a big sell. Um, and it sort of, it sort of, what it boiled down to was the real challenge around numbers. Yeah. For a lot of people, when they want to measure success, want to measure performance and teams, it all boils around numbers. And it all boils down to primarily um, uh, money. Yeah. Uh, it could be widgets and whatever, but it still transposes to money. And that's the way people measure it. And as much as that is a way, it's not everything. And of course, the whole big challenge is, well, yes, but your team's not working as well as it could do. So if we did that bit, that help. Well, yeah, but how do I prove it? And therein lasted a really interesting quandary for a long time for us to try and get a head around that. And I'll never really, never get it solved with the, the company I had before previously. And when I eventually left after the crash in 2008 and decided it was uh, time to move on and set myself up my own business mm. um, and set Wingman up, one of my um, goals was to try and get my head around about what is it that I do? Mm. What is my proposition? Because it can't be Rory Inderwood. Because I could have just set up myself Rory Inderwood and just earned the money from that, but actually I didn't want to. I wanted to set it up as we all do. We want to build something up for not so much legacy, but prepare prepare life after work, sure. set the future up for retirement with the, with the missus and the kids, yeah. uh, and set a lifestyle you want to, to live. And so for me, just staying rural it only gave me limited, because mm. I only got so many days I can sell on myself. Sure. Yeah. So I needed to go down the line of it being a company and, and creating something. And so IP proposition and stuff like that was really fundamentally important. Um, and it was that constant challenge. It was the, yes, the what is important, the numbers, but also is the how yeah and it was the how bit that people really struggled a lot of time to really understand okay yes but what does that mean how do we do it how much it cost and well how can i get an ri on it yeah and so that was a real 
challenge for us to really get it without it just coming across as just being team building. Mm. And so that was a real um, challenge over several years. And so it wasn't until about, I mean, it's difficult to lose track of time because last of the years just seemed to have blurred. But <laughs> We've lost a year, yeah. About, I don't know, three, three to five years ago, I just started getting into a situation where I started um, being able to crystallize some of my thinking. It's like anything else. When you've, when you've been working for like 15 odd years in this world that we're in, you, you gather so much information, so much knowledge, so much anal uh, analogies and thoughts and models and tools and various things. And the way I described it was like, I've got all that knowledge. All of us, people like yourself, have been in the business. You've got all this knowledge in your head. I described it like, if you look up at a starlit night and the countryside, no, no ambient light, you look up at the stars, all those different stars up there are all my things, bits of knowledge in my head. And I've got a few constellations I remember because I don't know them all. I know the Big Dipper and the Big Bear and I know Orion's Belt and there's a few other ones possibly the North Star. But I don't really know them all. And so I describe it as like, that's, that's like my head with all the stuff in there. But I don't have the ability to be able to coalesce that into some sort of tangible entity, mm. something that provides that sort of proposition of what is it about me that makes what mm. Wingman does differently. And it, and it, took having somebody else to help me with regards to, what's the right way of doing it? I think it's just, I think asking the simple questions. Yeah. I've just, um, I had it for about a year, just trying to help me formulate this, my sort of thinking and coalesce it. And it, and it, and it's sort of some ideas came out and then just having somebody just um, asking those sort of, um, the, the stupid questions basically, mm. and trying to answer them really challenged me to really get my head around some of the thinking. And so over a period of about a year, 18 months, the whole context of my thinking just started shaping into how do I balance getting people to understand in a model between the what and the how. Yeah. And my simplistic language, that is then the commercial side of what you do in a business, as well as the cultural bit of what you do in a business. And how do you do that in such a way that it's simple and easy to understand, whilst at the same time, measure it yeah. and that was the biggest challenge I had was the measuring bit especially when you talk from a cultural perspective mm. um, and I look back on on the journey and it's been interesting you know sometimes I go through phases where I think oh, I've not achieved much and I go and talk to someone I say well I've done this and I go Crack, you've come a long way all right, all right. <laughs> you don't realize how much work you put in you know sat on the train from Grantham down to London and I just pot around in my, 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 my sort of notebook and make ideas and I cycle, that's my, I'm a, I'm a mammal, so I go cycling in the Vale of Beaver around here. So I'm cycling, if I go on my own, I'm just sort of, your, your brain wanders and you start thinking. I'm in the car driving to clients and my, my brain starts thinking. <laughs> and you're starting to put these things together. And, you know, so sometimes I think, like, I don't have the ability to do it. Well, I've got the ability to do it, like, then. It takes time, it takes a lot. It's not something that can happen in, like, a, mm. a week. It'll happen over a month, a month, and, you know, and iterations and various things. But eventually we got there. And it was interesting because asking the silly questions, one of the things that really struck a chord with me while I was going through this whole process was, um, I don't know where I came across it, um, but a phrase, if you can't describe something that's complicated simply, then you don't fully understand it, really, really resonated with me. Mm. And so when this other guy would ask me some of the stupid questions, partly because he didn't understand, and partly because, as I explain now, is that, I just get frustrated. Well, I've just explained that. I've already said that. I've, I sort of go, no, no, no. If they're having to ask the question, then I obviously haven't described yeah. it well enough. And so going through that process really took me through a process myself of trying to understand what I'm doing and constantly revisiting it. So it was it was invaluable. Um, and now I've created that model um, to the extent that it's now becoming a vocabulary and um, structure that I use when I go and talk to people about what I do and when we talk about what their challenges are, whatever, which is for me speaks volumes about how powerful it is and what it, it's mm. it's trying it, you know it's there to do. So that's been a been a fascinating, interesting journey. And for me, in the last five years, has suddenly changed everything from the point of view of just being a Roar Indwood company now to being Wingman, who was started by Roar Indwood. Because now I've got the, the stuff that I've created is stuff that I don't have to do. Yeah. So it's enabled the company now to be able to grow because I can um, scale up because it doesn't require me to do it. Yeah. I can train other people to do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that is 
something that's going to be um, that's that's a game changer for us as a, as a small business, which is very frustrating because we were going to launch it big time last year. Yeah. And so obviously it's been pushed to the right quite a lot, um, which in some ways means that at the moment we're obviously working and, and surviving, but also using using whatever time we have as well at, uh, at finessing all the bits. Yeah, so you'll be that ready to kind of come out of the blocks fast when the yeah. time is right. I mean, there's so much value in here, you know, if it, from a business point of view, whether someone listening is is kind of got their own business and they're trying to grapple with, well, what is our proposition? Why would someone you know, pay for our services or products. I think, you know, what you've just described there in terms of the whole process you went through of just trying to really crystallise it. Yeah. I think a lot of people, a lot of small business owners and founders will absolutely resonate with what you're saying, but having a really clear proposition that you can absolutely articulate. In, it is in when we're servicing. I mean, the biggest problem is because we're a service industry, part yes. of the service sector. It's, so, not, it's not so tangible. Yeah, if, I was, not, if I was yeah. building widgets, easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a widget. It'll cost this. Yeah. This is the benefit. It's a... And trying to do that from a more ethereal point of view, a conceptual mm. point of view from what we're trying to do uh, is way, way much harder. And mm. of course, you're you're striving to, um, there's lots of people like the consultants all over the country. Yeah. So how do you differentiate from all of us? Um, why do people, you know, um, think that should go with X rather than Y? Mm. So that's, that's the biggest challenge. And I think in some ways, there's two things. A, it's been that it's been the facing towards customer to try and get business, I think is important. Secondly, I think it's also internally from understanding yourself as a, as a company, what you're about. Because if you don't understand that, then, then it doesn't help you trying to understand, to create your identity and your, yep. uh, the whole context of what you're about. Um, and so that's why it's funding important. That's why it's been much more crystal clear. So I, I, there's no doubt I felt a much greater sense of direction with my company since I got that sorted out in the last three, four, mm. five years. Mm. Definitely. Well, yeah. I, well, I think clarity of purpose is absolutely fundamental, yeah. isn't it? Whether it's from a business point of view, you know, what is your business all about? Or for yourself in your life and what you want to achieve, you know, what do you want to be known for? You know, why are you here? Why mm. are you here on this planet? You know, and it's there's some big quest questions there, aren't there? That's you gone know? a bit very deep all of a sudden. It has gone very deep all of a sudden. And I didn't mean it to. I but, but I think you're absolutely right. Unless you have that clarity, and some people never get it, yeah. or some people get it really quickly, and other people grapple with it over time. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think it comes with um, a bit of maturity and age, and that you know yeah, yeah. that you, you think about these things probably more as you get older or as you mature your well, business. I think, I think half well. the problem is is that, as well, any any person who starts a business from scratch, you go through the phase where everybody just dives in and you just do what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. You just do what you need to do to, to generate the business to start going. Yeah. And it goes back to the bit we talked about before, where sometimes you don't give yourself enough time to think. Mm. And therein lies it's a sort of self fulfilling prophecy that you'll never have enough time to do that yeah. sort of stuff. So in some ways, that is half the problem. Yeah. And, and you could argue the more successful you are, the less time you're going to have. Well, in fact, the less successful you are, the less time you're going to have because you're going to spend more time trying to save the company or whatever. Yeah. So it is a very difficult thing. That's why, in some ways, the discipline of trying to create that time, you know, I don't, I, it's not something that I purposely do. It's not as if I set myself... I, you know, for some people who just work from an office and they just have no time, it's like you know, program yourself an hour's um, slot in your diary, yeah. actually put it in there as, as a you know okay, me time, yeah. and then nobody can get on there. And that's you, you're doing something at, proactive about it. Yeah. Whereas for me, I don't actually do that because there's no need because uh, I have time when I know I'm on a bike on my own, when I'm mm. in the car a lot, mm. travelling or mm. whatever. I do have lots of time. I do know that I've got spare time when I can do some yeah. of that reflection uh, yeah. type stuff. Um, and that 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 is very important yeah. um, to do. That. I think also, for me, I can do some of that stuff myself, but I do value, and it's part of me being. I'm, I am a team person. I, I prefer having people around me, mm -hmm. so I do prefer having um, those sort of discussions with other people as well. Yeah, and, you, and a point you made earlier, Rory, was around you know the the gentleman that helped you articulate this mm. by asking the the simple questions, yep. um, and arguably they're the most powerful questions sometimes, mm. aren't they? You know, but actually having someone sort of facilitate that for you um, was clearly quite. I think I think part of it was because of where we started. I don't think he realised what he was doing. <laughs> Half of it was he was just trying to understand in his own mind. He wasn't a. He wasn't, because one of the problems he had was that he wasn't 
he was a business coach, but he wasn't a trainer stroke facilitator. So, you know, not quite understanding the difference between coaching and facilitating yes. would be a challenge for him. So it was it was things like that and saying, um, okay, that was really good. So can you do can you do a program like that? Yeah. Okay, how long would it take to, 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 to create it? What? A six day program? Well, it's not gonna happen overnight, you know. Had no concept of yeah. how you write a program, how you create a program and the substance that goes with it. So and that wasn't that was a frustrating thing at times, but other times it was part and parcel of the process of going through of trying to it wasn't a case of defending against him. It was def- getting myself to understand, well, do I understand it? Yeah. Because if he doesn't, well, yeah. why would anybody else understand it? Yeah. So I wouldn't say it was by default, but it was one of those things that it sort of, it, it will work. It was almost a byproduct yeah. of, of him building sense. his understanding. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get you. But I guess the, you know, t- for me, I think I've had, I know from my own career, I've had different people at different times that mm. have really supported me either... Um, overtly or in, or you know sort of in the background you know mentors coaches mm. can be a compassionate friend or yeah, you know yeah. someone that sponsors your career in the business for example you know and I think those people you above. spend time around it, it's absolutely critical I go cycling every weekend if not more depending on the, on the, the weather currently it's a bit icy at the moment <laughs> but um, a guy I live in the village um, he's been a CEO of a very very large um, very well known company um, and we've been cycling for the last I think probably nearly 10 years now and we we just talk so he talks about his challenges with his billion pound business I talk about my challenges with some of my clients and mm. how I build my company and stuff and it's just offering friendship and um, um, counsel basically yeah and sometimes you don't get anything except just having got it off your chest and sometimes you walk away going, oh crack, there's a good couple of little nuggets I got there. Yeah, yeah. But it's, um, it doesn't have to come from anything formal. No, absolutely. You know? And it's, um, it's not so much a problem shared as a problem halved, it's more a question of, there are lots of people out there who have the same interesting challenges. Mm. So talk about it. Oh, and that's exactly, you know, one of the reasons why I do this podcast yeah. because it, it's purely to help people, you know, whoever's listening to this, I'm sure they'll be picking up on things you're saying. Obviously, you're very well known and respected character in all of you know everything that you've done professionally in sports and in business. But nonetheless, there'll be people listening going, "Oh gosh, really? Rory felt like that, or he did that." I've got that problem. It is or, because I I, you know? I can completely um, vouch for that because leading up to the bit that I went through, I was going through that challenging in my own mind. But I was speaking to lots of different people around all the people I knew, people that be- were clients that became friends, people, etc., etc., etc. And picking their brains around the challenge I had and what, and they sort of got the whole concept and they, mm. they sort of did it and said, yeah, you know, I get where you're trying to go. So part of that was was helping me to drive towards where I eventually got to as yeah. well. Yeah. And that only came about because, you know, it wasn't, it, this, in no way was this me just thinking for 15 years and mulling over it and thinking, right, I need to do this. It's nothing like that. It was a constant... Uh, evolution of ups and downs and left and rights and speaking to people and and you know lots of blind alleys and um false dawns and all sorts of different things till eventually you get there now there are some people that will go bang first six months this is my idea this is what we're doing it's very crystal clear and in some ways i'm very envious of those people um for me it's 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 taken a while yeah, well, I mean, what's the saying? It takes 10 years to make an overnight success. Well. <laughs> Along the lines, or it might be 20 years for some people. Or I, hope, sure. I hope that comes true. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because people will only normally either see the big success or the big fa- what yeah. they see as failure. Well, we, you know, the you reality know, is life's not like that, is you it? Know, yeah, it is. I mean, I did one of my first um, blogs I did, um, during because I got more into blogs after, obviously during the lockdown, as we all have done. Yes. And uh, I looked at actually um, I got in touch with the uh, Office for National Statistics uh, very helpful I uh, really are people don't realize just you know get in touch with them and ask about numbers and anything it's got the business side of things and um, you know you pay for it some bit the cost is not is not is not stupid mm. and I got talking to them about the whole context of how many new businesses start um, every year mm. and how long do they last and how do they die now one of the problems they have they, got, they, they can't measure if you have you know, um, 100,000 companies, you know, register with Company House. Yeah. Um, how do they keep a track of those each year? 
because it's obviously you can imagine it's a monumental thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. All they can say is um, how many are born each year and how many die each sure. year. Yeah. As well as if it goes, but notwithstanding that, what they do know is when you look at the numbers of companies that start. I mean, I was told when I first started, um, within the first year, ninety percent of the business go bust, and in the second year, the next ninety percent of that lot go bust, which is like. Oh my God! When you talk about taking risks, you sort <laughs> what of think, am I doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, the fact I've run two businesses uh, and got to where we've got to, yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, at the end of the day, I can feel very proud of what what I we have achieved mm-hmm. uh, in doing that. Um, but when you look at the number of businesses that go through that early stage of trying to get through from the you know micro to small and get yes, to the medium yeah. sector, you know, it's fraught with lots of um, carnage mm. for a variety of reasons, mm. um, and so. It's a um, it's a well trodden path, but it's also a well you know it's uh, it's swings around about whether you make it or not. Well, yeah, and I guess I guess your sporting career as well must have helped with that to a certain degree because you know when you don't win a game, you lose a game. You, you're going to learn from that, aren't you? Know how you're going to address things in in training or whatever, and and it's it's the same in business, isn't it? Failure isn't isn't failure. It's it's learning, isn't it? You know, and and life really. Another phrase you like my phrase, and so another another quote. That's a quote. I don't know where I got it from. <laughs> the only mistake you'll ever make is one you never learn from. Well, that's, a, and that's, that's perfect, isn't it? I mean, um, I mean, that's from from in the military sense, from the flying. The time is not is critical. You can't. You don't have as much time. I mean, in, you know, I explain to people when I go through flying training for all pilots and uh, navigators, but for pilots, that three three to four year journey. In every trip, you have to do pre work to learn what was being done. You're given a brief. You're expected to go and fly it. Some of it was being told you, but you had to have a rough idea what was going on. You have to try and apply the skill. And then you finish, you debrief, you try and take on the, the lessons. The next trip, that you weren't doing the stuff we just done. They expect you to know that. So you're doing the next bit of things. So yeah. you're actually, for three to four years, of you're constantly being given stuff, and there's a rate. And I take the one at uh, Cranwell, that's 150 hours, 150, 160 hours. You had about five or seven hours flex they call it so if there's any problems you made mistakes you only had about seven hours which is seven trips roughly a, a trip's an hour mm. to be able to catch up if you need to do any remedial work there's not much flex in the system there's a bit with regards to weather and stuff because you know you get airborne and the weather's not good enough and you land and you've wasted the trip yeah. but um you have to keep at a certain pace and if you don't you drop off and you you fail the course and so you know the desire to push and drive and get you to somewhere but that's because it's a very you know it's high performance you, yeah you know there are when i was flying so it's about six thousand air crew in in you know pilots in the royal air force i mean now there's a lot less but mm. at my time well six thousand in the context of the country i mean what percentage is that you, you you're definitely in the top two percentile if not point two yeah um and so when you think about rugby, how many rugby players are in the country, and I'm in the top 15 players in the country playing for England. Yeah. Again, you're in that top, elite. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, in the in the in a company sense, it's we've got a long way to go. All opportunity. <laughs> but it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every challenge is an opportunity. So you know how you get there and learning as you're going along definitely is. Yeah. If you if you don't learn, you'll tread water at best. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's progress, isn't it? A sense of progress in whatever you're doing in life, you know, is is where actually the joy comes. You know, well, because it just feels like you're achieving something. You're either yeah. growing, you're moving forward, you're generating more new people. I mean, you know, as I said this to people, when I talk about you know people that start a business, well, suddenly, oh, yeah, business, working hard, guys. How many people I got? Thirty-five. Where'd they all come from? Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I we did a when was it? I think either the beginning of last year or it was sort of the end of the year before, so the end of 2019. And uh, decided to do a sort of a bit more of a glossy sort of uh, brochure about us and various things because we got the work that we'd done with the proposition. It gave us a bit more substance to put into it. Yeah. And at the very back page, decided to do a, okay, who's in the business? And so we've got both people employed as well as associates. Had eight. I was like, yeah. Where'd that come from? <laughs> you know, yeah. some of them are part time and various things, but still, you suddenly go, eight. Yeah. It's, um, you sometimes, it get, when you're involved in it and you're so blinded by being busy, you forget sometimes that where you've come. And sometimes yeah. you've got to stand up, look around, and go, actually, I have achieved something. 
That's a great take out because, as you say, when you're an ambitious person and always wanting to strive for more and more and better, mm. um, sometimes you miss you miss the the wins along the way, the little yeah. the little, and they can sometimes be quite small, can't they? It's important to recognise. But those. it's also, in some ways, you look at it. It's sort of saying, "Yeah, well done." Yeah, absolutely, pat on the you back. Know, pat on the back. Yeah, don't be so hard on yourself. The, win, the wins, <laughs> the wins for some people are just like I've made my first hundred thousand. I made my first two fifty. I made my first yeah. five hundred. I made my yeah. first million. But sometimes, yes, but you've achieved, I've moved, you know, I, I, this office we're in now, we've yeah. moved in last year. You know, it's a big step for us as a company that we're working uh, out of a, uh, a wooden, um, you know, shed, for want of a better description, uh, in my garden. Um, you know, I walk in this office and I feel a sense of pride whenever I walk in. Absolutely, rightly so. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because what you were talking about before was around scaling the business mm. and how... You know, obviously, you're the founder, you're the big name that everyone knows, um, but there's a limit. There's only so many hours in a day for you. So, so to to have put the work in that you've done to create the model and a replica, replicable, scalable yep. model that then allows the business to grow. And for you, yes, okay, to still be there, mm. you know, and absolutely core, core to the DNA, but without restricting it because of the, of the limitation Massively. of just you as one individual. I think, I think that's it, a key move, isn't it? I don't it, know what you? it was. It's just like, you know, when I first the business before, we just the three of us running, and, and I don't know, it's one thing, we did this exercise about, okay, how much will you pay when you retire? Give us this number. And then we had to work out how much we had to build the pension up. That was quite frightening. When you do something like that, it's really frightening. Uh, when you say, we average, you're going to live for 20 years when you retire, yeah. and you, <laughs> you're going to earn 50,000, 100,000, whatever it is. And then you go, okay, well, if you do that, we've got to earn this much to put in the pot for that time. Yeah. That's, oh my God. You know, that's, um, yeah. that's uh, it is a bit of a, oh my God at yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, um, oh, question again. Yeah, so we so we were talking about scaling up and making sure that you know you've got all the, everything in place to um, to actually be able to scale yeah. up and not be so, restricted by one individual in the business. Yeah, so in the context of, um, I suppose what it, for me, for me retirement is not stop working and go and do crosswords and play golf and whatever and, and cycle lots. For me, when I think about retirement, retirement to me is. Is being have the ability to be able to choose what you want to do. Yeah. Now, to a certain extent, I have that now, but the aspiration is when I say choose what I do, I want to do X, Y, Z, have certain perks of mm. my life and whatever. And I don't see myself retiring per se. I don't see myself just getting started. Let's do it. I, I, I. Sometimes I, at times I can be quite the lazy person. I quite happily sit in front of TV and watch watch TV and rugby or movies or whatever. But I do recognise that I do need to stimulate the old noggin. So. Yeah. Um, I don't see that, and I, get, I don't get, I get bored. Yeah. So, for here, I mean, this is why this is a, a useful vehicle. So I want to build it such that I can scale it up, make all the IP and stuff um, uh, replicable, as you say, yeah. and create um, a business that doesn't require me to be in every day. Yeah. I enjoy the perks of having built the business. The business yeah. runs itself, yeah. and I pick and choose yeah. who I want to work with and charge them stupid amounts of money for yeah. my time because yeah. if you don't want to it's fine I've got an extra few days going playing golf so that's only come about because of the work I've done to create the ability to scale up and yeah. whatever it wasn't the, the business before was not in a in a it wasn't in a, a structure that enabled it. it we were growing but it was at a certain rate yeah yeah and it was always going to be at a rate that had a finite entity to it whereas now it's obviously got an infinite yeah, uh, potential yeah. for it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, you know, when I spend a lot of time advising on businesses and, and very often it's around, you know, putting the processes, the systems in place so that you can step away from the business and the business still runs. So yeah. you're working on your business, not in your business. And, and that, that, I think, is the important thing. Yeah, I've got a very similar phrase. It's that yeah. um, you're doing the business, but who's running the business? Yeah. It's one challenge to give to a lot, especially business owners, because they're in their hands dirty doing all they're the in stuff. The weeds, down in the weeds, you know, yeah. I've got stuff because I could get rid of most of the stuff and do it all myself, but I'll be flipping 22 hours a day working and they can do it much better. Jane's my right hand person. She's yeah. brilliant and she's worth her weight in gold. Yeah. I've got other people doing all the same stuff, which allows me to then concentrate on. I remember one point, I can't remember it was before the, the lockdown, I remember. Uh, it was just the f particular phase of various things. I got to, I was like, mm. um, I'm not sure why, whether I got to do something or something, but 
because I've got so and so doing this, and it's just like, and he's like, I can remember one particular point, which one uh, the afternoon, I was like, what am I going to do? And I, I had stuff to do, but it's like that strange sort of feeling of going, <laughs> oh my god, am I out of a job? Um, but it's um, it, it, it's it's finding people who are better at the job and doing it. And it's damn sight more cost efficient them doing it than you doing it. Yeah, yeah. And also not being, um, I'm not suggesting this is this is for you for a second, but not feeling like you're the only person that can, or the one that oh, can 100%. do the best job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And 100%. that's partly putting people's ego to one side as well and saying, actually, you know what? They're, I'm sorry. Just recruit really smart people. I'm sorry, but I am more than happy to give a job to somebody else who can do it damn sight better than I. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I grew up with PowerPoint. When I was doing my station flight safety job, I, I learned PowerPoint on Windows uh, Office 97 or whatever it was. So I learned from a very early stage. And I was doing lots of stuff, animation and various things that, as, as you could do, um, limited as it was in those days. Um, and I love doing it, but Jane can do it 10 times yeah. faster than I can. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'd, I'd love doing that sort of stuff and various things, but actually, you know, it's it's much better. And and that and that and that's the trip on you. you you'll recognise this. You have that entrepreneurial business owner sort of growing a business. At some point, you've got to understand. You've got to start letting go of the yeah. of the of the reins. Yeah. If you don't, you are. You're the blocker. Hundred percent. Yeah. Massively. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, going back to the point you said before, you know, the whole context about uh, purpose was very important to me. The process that goes through. Mm. But for me, you can imagine the other thing is people. Yeah, absolutely. Massively, you can tell. I think I'm very passionate about teams, and for me, it frustrates. You know, I spend my whole. I suppose fundamentally the ethos of what I'm talking about is I spend my, my life trying to engage with businesses to get them to understand, to get the environment right, they get the people working right, their business will be successful. Mm. And people don't quite fully understand that. Um, they don't quite understand, I've told them what the job is, they should just do it. Um, and, and, and those are the people that really you just wish, you just saw them see the light about some of the things you can put in place, just simple stuff to put in place. That can have a monumental change to their business. Mm. I talk about, um, it's a lot of, obviously from wingman and, and my flying background. I talk about any business, and you'll recognise this with the people you talk to, uh, and yourself from your own um, experience, that whenever you grow as a business, you know, whatever size you are, you always have things that you feel are like dragging you in your business, but just doing things. And so drag is the phrase we use. You know, mm. We talk about this all the time, what's dragging your business? And so part of that model that we have just identifies drags and, and articulates it and quantifies it in simpler simpler sort of chunks down. So obviously what we want to do is try and reduce the drag to increase the lift. Yeah. So lift your business to help you grow. That's, it's yeah. in essence, that is fundamentally what we're trying to do. People don't recognize they're having drag. It's just, it's just the sort of noise that goes oh, with the business. it's always been like that. C correct. Yeah. <laughs> and then obviously, then they don't know what to do. Well, they don't recognise in the first place, but if they do, they don't know what to do about it. Mm, mm. And so that's... And that's where you help. Yeah. yeah. So so just, just to sort of bring all of this together, because clearly you've been in three incredibly high-performing areas yourself in your personal career, but also with where you help other businesses yeah. as well. So what does what are the ingredients of high performance in your mind? What, what, makes, what makes a high-performing team, whether it's in a sporting context or a business context? Um... Well, I suppose it goes, it's what we just talked about just now. Um, there's got to be an ultimate purpose for what you're trying to strive to do. For me, yeah. I talk about, does the individual understand their individual purpose? Do they understand the purpose within the team they're operating in? Do they yeah. understand the team within the organisation? If those don't line up, then you're going to get drag. Secondly, the people. You know, I, I always use this analogy. 90% of the time, when I was playing rugby for England or I was um, flying jets, we were training. And you'd argue only 10% of the time you were actually doing. Yeah. Now, you regard us as a high performance organisation. So when I hear, well, so I, I ask the question of, when I ever do this, I always ask people the question, so what do you think business does? And they all flip flop it around. And I use it. So roughly 10% um, training, 90% doing. Mm. And I would advocate of that 10%, 9%, is um, governance, compliance, need to do the job. So it's, it's stuff that they have to do to be able to do the job. And 1% is actually development. There's a difference, only 1% mm -hmm. development work. Mm -hmm. And so you have to tell people, so the difference is training. So training is you know, getting you, um, having the capability to do the job for today. Yeah. 
and then development is developing people for the future. And that's the bit that people just do not get right. Yeah. And when I say to people, uh, sort of to, to business owners, business boss, what is the most important resource in your business? Now, people could say there's a few little interesting because of certain types of businesses, but fundamentally, it boils down to people. Yeah. Which resource in your business do you invest the most time, money, and resource in? It never is people. Mm, and so you sort of, well, why, when people talk about wanting to be a world-class organization and they spend 1% time developing their people, do they possibly think they can become a world-class organization? Mm. So that's a big challenge. So from my point of view is teams, individuals, and there's a lot of work done with sort of teams, but not as much work done with teams within an organization. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I just come in. for me one of the one of the biggest things one of there's many one of the biggest challenge is just the lack of cross functional relationships or the lack of uh, quality high cross functional relationships. People working in silos. They're yeah. working in silos, and yeah. of course, two things: a the business drives down a very solid from a leadership point of view, yeah. and b people don't understand their purpose within the bigger picture. So they don't understand how it all fits together anyway. So mm -hmm. you've got no cut selling chance. They'll just do what they do, clock on, clock off, because they keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned it earlier on as well. There's the whole context of how do you make sure, uh, I, I talk about process, but for me, process within an organization, within high performance, anything, it's all of us have got information, whether it's spoken, data, whatever, it doesn't make a difference. It's just yeah. knowledge and information. How do we ensure that every single person on that team, in that organization, in that high performance environment, has the ability to get hold of that information as and when they need it? And so for me, those are the three things. So that, that clarity of purpose, mm -hmm. the, the quality of people, and also the, the quality uh, and efficiency of, of the process that goes around mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. And you get those three things right, you're, you're on your way towards tracing, and then, and that's why I mentioned before. That's you know that's 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 what I'm striving to. This is what Wingman's all about. We're about how do you create how do you create the right, uh, so this challenge I give to us how do you create the right environment where high performance is inevitable, and that's a challenge I give to any business owner or business leader. What are you doing to create the right environment where high performance is inevitable? Mm. And if you can't answer that question, then there's the opportunity. Correct. Mm. What I love about that um, is that it's equally applicable to a small business oh, yeah. or, you know, businesses that, that I've run where I've had, you know, 1,700, 1,800 mm. people globally. The principles are exactly the same. Yeah. They're just, the numbers are different. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's why what you offer and your team offer as Wingman is, is, is great because it's exactly what so many businesses need. Um, Massively. And, you know, we recognise that some of the, the immediate need is that is in the small business to medium business sort of area mm, mm. because you know they've suddenly grown and they're being successful and of course you increase in, increase in footprint you increase in increase in numbers mm. more people more complexity and so everything gets more complicated which creates more drag yeah and so at some point you've got to work out how do you try and overcome that and so you know that's why um aircraft look the way they do because over the years they've just learned how to make the, the aircraft more efficient and reduce the drag to be able to create more lift. I mean, you look at you look at modern um, airliners now, the Jumbo 380 or the 350s or the Dreamliners. You look at the wing, yeah. and you look at how that just, but the, all the changes they've done to that wing to create the lift to be able to carry that massive sort of uh, mm. piece of equipment is incredible. Yeah. You know, and it's not, and this, this is, so that's, that's a good analogy. So I would say that a lot of people just go, well, just put a bigger engine on it, so we'll go faster. Yeah, but that's just a lot of effort and energy for trying to achieve the same thing. Whereas if you work much more effectively with each other and create a much more sensible wing, mm. you can get a smaller engine on it, less effort. So, you know, it's how do you, so that's, that's our catchphrase. So this is a good um, plug. So how do you, um, do you want to fly higher and faster with less effort? Hence the flying sort of uh, link and all that sort Perfect. of thing. Perfect. Well, I absolutely love that. So I have got a couple of final questions, if I may. Okay, yeah. go on. <laughs> so... What would you say is the best piece of advice you've ever been given, or one of the best pieces of advice? Well, I've had I've had so many. I mean, I've I've already mentioned some of my my yeah. sayings. So pick any of those ones you want to. <laughs> um, I 
I don't know. It's, it's interesting because it's probably it's, it's it's partly business, but it's also we've we've touched on. It's been interesting. I, I don't know whether this conversation is sort of resonate with you from a point of view of the balance of home life and stuff like that. Yeah. When I first left the business, and um, I was speaking to a friend of mine, and uh, you know, when my wife Wendy was obviously uncomfortable because suddenly when you're in the Air Force, you have a guaranteed salary coming in every month, and suddenly you don't. Mm. And she wasn't working full time, you know, um, housewife and that sort of stuff. And uh, so I was like, you know, you know. And he said, Rory, but remember, he says, for you, it's like you're stood on top of the ramparts of the castle looking out of your kingdom and seeing what you want to do. She's sat down, stood down in the uh, courtyard. She can't see what you can see. Mm. I thought oh, that really resonated with me in the whole context of, you know, part of the ability to do that is also your personal support structure. Yeah. So being able to have those, and it just sort of part of the things we talked about earlier on about knowing uh, who to go and speak to. And it doesn't have to be a professional, it doesn't have to be me or you. It can be anybody. Yeah. Utilize people in business, other places, and just, just talk about things. But it's also with certain people like that, especially um, your spouses, is um, getting them to feel comfortable and, and knowledge if you are a big massive risk taker what goes with it yeah yeah no that's brilliant and have you ever had any bad advice given to you that you've either ignored or or taken and, and thought afterwards i wish i hadn't followed that advice um, <laughs> not not really but it's interesting because the other the other sort of good advice I nearly said to you was one I was told very very early in my playing career when it was more about playing was uh, after each match we had a um, dinner at the Hilton and you go there and they have all the alakadoos there so you have all the old committee men and everything out there and you, you've just played a rugby match that afternoon you're knackered <laughs> and you go, oh, would you, you didn't do this you need to do that you know you should do this you should you, know, you should think about doing this and uh, and this one guy came and says oh, yeah. he wasn't as, as pushy and I said uh, um, you know, just listening to every talk, he says, yeah, well, just take one piece of advice. He said, you can listen to anybody, you know, listen to anybody that wants to talk to you, but obviously you choose what you want to take. Yeah. And that was quite profound, because obviously you think everything, you take everything to heart, you think everything's just, let's just take, for anything you think, okay, that works for me, then use it. Because we all work differently, just because somebody offers you advice doesn't mean that they understand everything about you, and it might not necessarily work for you. Um, and so, you know, Sometimes it's just having the ability to be able to sort out the wheat from the chaff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that and that obviously stuck stuck with you. From, yeah, that uh, that that, that, that particular ago. one has yeah, stuck with me a yeah. long time. And by Christ, you know, I haven't necessarily got the wheat and the chaff sorted out all the time. <laughs> However, you know, you're aware of it. We're work in progress. Yeah. So, final question: What does brave, bold, brilliant mean for you, Rory? Um, mm, interesting. Um, I had somebody who I knew, who I know, who um, once was regarded as being a hero. And he said, I'm not a hero. I was in a situation that I basically had to survive. Whereas somebody who makes a conscious decision to do something that they wouldn't have normally done, that's somebody who's brave. For somebody who decides to put themselves in harm's way or in a difficult situation or at risk, not necessarily personal, as in health, um, that's when you start being brave and bold. The difficulty with the question is obviously just being brave and bold doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be brilliant. And so it's come to terms with, at times, you won't always be. I mean, we have a great saying in the military, uh, pilots, you've got old pilots, you've got bold pilots. You don't have very many old and bold pilots. <laughs> That's the perfect way to end the podcast. So thank you so much, Rory. Pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been truly, truly wonderful. Thank you very much.